So with that said, Ephesians chapter 4 is where we are. Ephesians chapter 4. And if you're new to Calvary Chapel, one of the distinctives is anytime we gather, we are traveling through the scriptures, a book of the Bible, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And we've been in Ephesians. This is week 18. I am so excited because I've silenced all of my critics who said that I spend, you know, a year in a verse and uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, we are moving diligently through the book of Ephesians, and God is really uh, speaking to us. It's been really, really good. We have landed this morning at verse 25. We're going to finish chapter 4, verses 25 through verses 32 is what we're going to cover today. So let's stand and read it, and then we will kind of do a mini review as we ease into the new verses. So let's stand in the presence of our Lord. We're going to read the scripture. Verse 25. Therefore, put in away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer. We can kind of say amen to some of these. <laughs> But rather let him labor working with his hands what is good that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you. With all malice, and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And so, Father, we thank you for the text, for the word you've given us today. And that you continue, Lord, to just minister in our midst, Father. We surrender ourselves to you. We ask that you would remove the cares of this life, the burdens of this world, which is dark and evil, even the distractions from the room. All of the things, Lord God, that draw our attention away from you, that you would take this moment, this hour, let it be yours, Lord God, that you would speak to us collectively and individually, Lord God, having your way, rebuking, correcting, instructing, and encouraging all of the things that are needed for us, Lord. We desire to receive from you. We love you, and we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And so, Verse 25 is another one of those therefores, and we've seen a lot of therefores since we've been together in Ephesians, haven't we? Yes. And it can kind of take us all the way back to all of the wonderful things, and you know them. You know, chapter 1, that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing, remember, in heavenly places. Y'all remember that? Yes. Oh, every spiritual blessing that God has provided for us in heavenly places, and I want to experience them all. That we were not only that, but that we were chosen by God before the foundation of the world, which constantly reminds us, remember, constantly reminds us that before God began to create this ball of dirt that we now live on, before he did any of that, he knew each one of us in eternity's past. Before he even began the process, the Bible says he even knows every hair on your head. So we know from all of that stuff that every last one of you, every last one of us, could never, ever be an afterthought, but we are divinely loved and provided for and planned for by the God of all creation. Amen? And that each one of us is special, that he chose us before the foundation of the world, that, that he accepted us in Christ Jesus, that he predestined us according to his foreknowledge to be in Christ, then that he redeemed us by the blood of Christ, then to seal us by the Holy Spirit of promise. And the first, therefore, we found in the book of Ephesians came later in that chapter. He says, well, therefore, because of all of that, I do not cease to make mention of you in my prayers, that the God, that God would open the, 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 uh, enlighten the understanding of your heart, that these truths may be something that you not just read, but that you know and believe and hold on to. And that's what he said, because he said that because those of us who were dead in sins and trespasses, he has quickened or made us alive. We were dead, but he has made us alive. Amen? That we have been saved by grace through faith. And then that the two that were separate, Jew and Gentile, he's brought together, removing the middle wall of separation. Y'all remember that? taking away all hostility and bringing together in one body, one brand new body that he's created by his flesh, this beautiful building, which he calls now the church, his bride, 
which he has built upon the foundation, remember, of the apostles and prophets, which in and through he will be glorified and he will display the manifold wisdom of God to the principalities and heavenly places by how he works in us and therefore we have become God's masterpiece. Isn't that something? The church, his masterpiece, which he loves, and therefore he exhorted us as we ease into chapter 4, that we should endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Why? Because he's made this one unified body, and there's only one God over it, and that works through it, right? Y'all remember that? And so therefore we should work to maintain what he has established. And then he laid out the organization of it that he gave some to be apostles and some prophets. Verse 11, the foundational ministries, some evangelists and some teachers, the building ministries, that these have been sent forth to lay a foundation and begin a building. And why were they given to us? Y'all remember? For the equipping of who? The saints. That's y'all, right? That's us. Okay, so if you're from a Catholic background, you are now a saint because you're born again, okay? And you are alive and a saint. That's good news. That for the equipping of the saints, but why? For the work of the what? Ministry. That means we're all now in ministry. And why? For the edifying of the body of Christ. Building it up. Establishing it. Till we come to the full measure, measure of the statue of Christ. And so, therefore, he said last week as we went through verses 17 through 24, therefore, we need to cast off all of the old works that are dead, that we need to get rid of the new man, that we need to get away from the, the, the old man, which grows corrupt through this deceitfulness of sin, and we should put on the new man, look at verse 24, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in truth and righteousness and holiness, and that's where we are today. We are new creations, so let us walk in the newness of life. Amen? Amen. And so here's our outline for today. Three things we're going to see as we look at verses 25 through 30, uh, 32. That the new man, listen, the new man is learning to, number one, limit the enemy's effectiveness in his or her life. And we'll see that in verses 25 through 27. If you're taking notes, you got your Ephesians journal? All right, all right. Not only that, the new man is learning to be a more productive member of the body of Christ in verses 28 through 29. And then finally, the new man is learning to yield more and more to the Holy Spirit in verses 30 through 32, an easy way to remember this section. As we dive in together, verse 25, look at it with me. Verse 25, he says, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of us, excuse me, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Beautiful, beautiful scripture. In other words, he says, first, let us put away lying. And the interesting thing about that is we instantly understand what he's talking about because the truth of the matter is we're all liars. It's a part of the, the, the old man that, that we have lived with for so many years before coming into the Lord. Listen, here's a lie. A lie is a statement that is contrary to fact on the surface, but it goes deeper. In fact, I would say then, a lie is an intentional statement that is contrary to fact and that benefits me, right? In other words, if I tell you, if my watch is wrong and I give you the wrong time and didn't mean to do that, that's not a lie, is it? Right, but, but if I know the time and I give you the wrong time in order to make you late to whatever it is you're trying to get to, then I intentionally gave you the wrong time, therefore lying and for my own benefit. And so sometimes we understand that all of us lie. In fact, everybody lies. If you don't believe it, then all you got to do is go to a house where there's small children, find a mess, and ask them who did it. <laughs> and they will lie. <laughs> Even animals lie. You ask the dog who did it, and the dog don't want to own up to it. You know, everybody's lying in, in, in the house because we are liars. It's a part of the old nature. And we do benefit from it. In fact, sometimes we roll with the lies because, you know, they, they work in our favor. 
my uh, high school uh, football career, and I remember um, I got moved up the varsity, and I was all excited, and it was early in the year, and I was on varsity, and um, it was the rival game that weekend between the other uh, high school and the other high school from my county, and my uh, friend, Lamont Deloach, who I played middle school football with, went to the other high school. He was playing cornerback. I was playing receiver. Friday night lights, I'm ready to go. So the coach puts the stuff in the newspaper, and he listed me as wide receiver at six feet, 175 pounds. <laughs> Great news, but the, the problem is I'm actually 5'10 and a half, 165 pounds at the time, not now. <laughs> I remember those days. I said, coach, you know, you stretch this a little bit. He said, yeah, but they don't need to know that. I was like, you're right, coach. <laughs> they don't need to know that. So Lamont's thinking, man, Kevin's grown. We had a good Friday night, you know. And, um, but I roll with it because we all, we all lie. We've benefited from lies. And what we understood last week and what we know now is it's time for us to move away from the way we used to walk because now we're in the body of Christ, his bride. We need to begin to put lies away. Listen. Lies are the influence of Satan, whether we want to believe it or not. John 8, 44 on the screen says this, you are of your father. Now, this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees. Sunday school Jesus, you got to love him. He says, you are of your father, the devil. That's what he said to the Pharisees. I love Jesus. He don't pull the punches at all. He says, and the desires of your father you want to do. He says, uh, he was a murderer. Jesus talking about Satan from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and notice he is the what? Father of it. All lies are the influence of Satan. Satan was involved in the fall and, and, and it was rooted in lies because Satan went to Eve back in the book of Genesis and he says, have you, listen, he want, he's a liar. He wants us to believe that God is a liar. He says, has God really said as if God didn't say? And then later, don't worry. You won't really die. He just don't want you to know stuff. He's the author and the father of lies. Listen, the first sin in the church that was judged was rooted in a lie in Acts chapter 5 when Ananias and Sapphira came and they sold their property and everybody was giving stuff to the church at the time because there was a great need in the early church. And so they sold property and they kept some of the money back and they told the church that they gave it all so they could really look like they were spiritual. And Peter approached them, Acts chapter 5 verse 3, and Peter said, Ananias, why have Satan noticed fill thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? This is in the church. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land? It was yours. You could do what you want with it. You didn't need to lie. And so they both, him and his wife, dropped dead. And the Bible says in the same chapter, verse 11, and great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. A fear, a healthy fear went through the church in those early days because at the beginning of the church, God was trying to root out lies which bring all kinds of problems within the church. And so here's the thing. He says, therefore, putting away lying, listen, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. Well, who is the neighbor? Well, in the context of Paul talking to the Ephesian church, then the neighbor must be members of the church that are within their midst. And therefore, the neighbor in context, and for us today, is the people in the room with us now sitting to your left and to your right. Those are your neighbors. You with me? And so therefore, he says, therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, and here's the reason. Look at it. it. says, for we are members of one another. Now, that's hard language when you begin to look at that. Members of one another. Paul said it to the Romans this way on the screen, chapter 12, verse 4. He says, for as many, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one member's notice of the church, right? Y'all know the rules. No, of one another, because we are the church. 
And therefore, we're born into the church, and now we're members of one another. And that's a hard pill to swallow because that means I'm eternally connected with each one of you, and I couldn't get away from you if I wanted to. I can momentarily down here leave you and go to another church, but that doesn't solve the issue. We're members one of another. I'm eternally bound to a relationship with each one of you who are born again. And therefore, I'm eternally obligated as members one of another to watch how I speak to you and make sure that I'm not lying because lying affects us. And here's the thing that we often don't understand. Listen. What we don't realize is lying gives opportunity for the enemy to destroy, but truth allows the Lord to minister to us. And this is what we're seeing in this particular section. The first point of our outline, we limit the enemy's effectiveness, which I'll continue to talk about. Now, listen, if our bodies, if your body was the lie to itself, let's think about that for a moment. If your body was the lie to itself, there would be problems. Let's say you put your hand on the hot stove by mistake and your hand is now cooking. But because your hand and your arm got issues with, the, with each other, the arm doesn't tell the brain that the hand's cooking. The arm tells the brain everything's good, we're chilling. So now the hand is cooking away and the arm is ain't telling the truth. Maybe, hopefully, the, the nose will smell the smoke and tell the brain or the eyes will see it until the brain, so the brain can tell the feet to back up. Or else the whole body is going to be in, pro in trouble because the body is lying to one another and it's hindering any growth or effectiveness within the body. And we do this sometimes, don't we? Listen, sometimes, listen very carefully, sometimes we lie because we feel that the truth may be uh, harmful. It may hurt someone's feelings. And so, therefore, we lie because we feel like it's helping the other person out. Scripture tells us back up in verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ. So, we're called to speak the truth in love, but sometimes we're unwilling to be bold enough to do that in a loving way because we think we might hurt someone. But the truth is that the truth is what we need to grow the body. Let me give you a practical example. Let's say, now this would never happen at Calvary Chapel of Clayton. and has nothing to do with Calvary Chapel of Clayton. But let's say the worship leader just couldn't tell the truth in love because they just wouldn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Though, therefore, the worship leader let everyone that had no talent participate on the worship ministry. Now, the rest of us being members of the body got to suffer through that stuff because somebody wasn't willing to tell somebody that you ain't got no, this is not your call. <laughs> You should be doing something else. We had to suffer through that one time. My wife and I got invited to this thing down uh, south of Fayetteville, this little place called Cedar Creek. And um, we were in this church, and, and somebody wouldn't tell the truth in love. And this lady, boy, there was three ladies. They were all dressed in navy blue. But this one lady had, she, her, her dress had glitter on it because she wanted to stand out. And she was singing and going on, and it was so awful that the guy on the keyboard just stopped. He said, look, I don't even, I don't even know if that key exists. He literally stopped. And the rest of us, and see, I can't sit through it. I got up and went to the bathroom. It was horrible. <laughs> because there was no truth. And we have to be careful to speak the truth to one another in love. Because truth, listen, truth is how we grow one another. And within the body of Christ, y'all stay focused. Within the body of Christ, speaking the truth in love is necessary for us to function. And, and we grow and mature as we learn to do that. And so... When we lie, which we'll find out in a minute, we're, we're not hindering the enemy's effectiveness at that point. We're not limiting it. The next part of this, notice he goes on to say in verse 26, he says, be angry and do not sin and do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Listen, he says, be angry and do not sin. Notice that anger, listen, notice that anger is not forbidden nor discouraged, but in fact, even instructed. It's a part of our lives. And why is anger okay? Is Here's the reason why. Because anger is the natural response to sin in this evil, dark world. And make no mistake, listen to me very carefully, make no mistake. Sin destroys homes and families and lives. 
It is a rage and fire that that spreads and destroys, and it starts a little bit back over here. And if it's not checked and dealt with, it continues to grow until it literally sets everything ablaze and destroys everything in its path. And if you're dabbling with any sin today, and God has pointed it out, and you are not repenting from it, I guarantee you that it will bring destruction unless you repent from it. And see, we are being warned here. Not about anger. What we're being warned about in the text here is how to manage our anger. Because, see, our anger, if not managed, will quickly turn into sinful wrath. You see, the verse again says, be angry and sin not, and do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Warren Wearsby said it this way. He said, the fire of anger, if not quenched by loving forgiveness, will spread and defile and destroy the work of God. In other words, it's okay to be angry when we see wrong, when we see sin, but it's the re- how we respond with wrath which hinders God being able to work and minister in the middle of the situation. You see, anger is okay. God shows forth anger within the scriptures. In fact, Jesus was angry in the gospels. Jesus made a whip of cords and, and went in and cleansed the temple, turning over tables and driving out the money changers because they were defiling the place of God, which was meant for worship and prayer and taking advantage of the people of God who were trying to worship. So he, in his anger, put a stop to it without hurting anyone. You see, and that's kind of the point here. In fact, the Bible tells us, James chapter 1, verse 19 says, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Those are beautiful. I use this in marriage counseling all the time in the, in the area of communication. It's because we have one mouth and two ears. So let everybody be uh, swift to hear, slow to speak, but notice, slow to wrath. Why? For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. In other words, listen, we... Are sinners saved by grace and we have an old nature. And therefore, we are not to be trusted because we're not responsible enough to handle wrath. Because we don't know everything, we can't see everything, we don't even know one another's motives. And so when we go into wrath, we're going to bring hurt and destruction, which is irreparable. You go into wrath and you say something you can never take back. You destroy relationships and situations in the Lord and it is dangerous. We have to be very careful with our anger. Men, we are to teach our sons as, as they're young how to manage their anger because as men, our anger causes problems. Not only do we make holes in walls we got to patch up, we frighten children, ruin relationships. We got to check our anger. See, here's the thing. My children may experience my anger, but they will never experience my wrath. Listen, did you know that we, the church, according to the scripture, will never, ever experience the wrath of God, our father, and our king, Jesus, and and our husband, if you will, of the church. Did you know that? Look, the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, it says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that 1 Thessalonians 1, 10 says, And to wait for his son from heaven, whom whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us, and that word really in the Greek means rescues, delivers us from the wrath to come. Do you catch that? In other words, there is a wrath that's coming upon the earth, but we will never experience it being the children of God. And even when he pours his wrath out upon a Christ-rejecting world in uh, Revelation chapter 8, you get the sense that it's grieving him to do so. The Bible even says there's a pause and a silence in heaven for 30 minutes. And then nobody says a word. Something's happening on the throne. And then the angels are offering before God uh, with the coal from their incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And then after that pause and that silence, he begins to pour his wrath out on a world that he never created to receive his wrath but a world that has rejected him and turned from every bit of love that he's displayed. God is long-suffering and merciful and gracious and is slow to wrath. Anger is fine because there's a lot to be angry about in this horrible world. How can you look at this horrible world and not get angry? How can you hear about a child molestation or trafficking uh, and all that stuff and not get angry? Yes, you get angry, but sin not is what he's saying. 
We have to be careful with our anger. We are not responsible enough to handle wrath. So we have to be careful. And these things, listen, if we're not careful with lying, if we're not careful with our anger, in other words, if we don't check anger quick, what does God say? When we have issues with one another, the Lord says, go to your brother and talk it out. Go alone and have a conversation. And don't wait. Notice what he says next. He says, and do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Now, if I could watch if, and show you all the video of my wedding, which is in VHS, which the youth don't know what that is. We're getting old, y'all. VHS. Um, one of my wife's aunts said on the tape, never go to bed angry. You know, good advice, hard to live by. Because sometimes you just need space. I need to pray about this one for a little while, you know. <laughs> but the concept is true. Because if you let that thing fester, it's going to turn into what, what Paul is going to talk about over in verse 31. Bitterness. You see that? Bitterness and what comes out the bitterness in that verse? Wrath. See, you let that thing fester. He said, don't let the sun go down in your wrath. I believe that you shouldn't go to bed with the junk of this world and the issues that you deal with and let that stuff marinate overnight in your mind. You know, in fact, the uh, neurologists, they have discovered, those who are Christians, they have discovered the brain is sorting a lot of things out at night when we lay down to go to sleep. The body is repairing itself. The brain is sorting all the stuff from the day out. And I believe that the best way to go to bed is to take a bath in the word to cleanse some of that stuff away and go to bed on that. Amen. And let the brain sort that out to help you out overnight. I believe that in my, all my heart. I believe that. He said, do not let the sun go down on your wrath because then it festers in there. Bitterness comes. No, get that mess straight. Go talk to that person and deal with it within the Christian church because say, here's what happens when we don't. We allow the enemy to come in. Notice the next verse, 27, nor give place to the devil. Now, this is an interesting verse because this word place and I am going to go over time a little bit, most likely, so bear with me. But this word place has several implications in the Greek, okay? Number one, it means a, a space marked off within a surrounding area. In other words, a space has been marked off for something. It, it, it means an inhabited space, like a district, okay? An inhabited space. It actually implies in the Greek a passage, like within a book, okay? It actually implies in the, in the Greek an opportunity or a power or occasion. So in other words, what he's saying is do not give place to the devil or do not give or allow any marked off space within your life for the enemy. No place for him to begin to inhabit because that's what he's trying to do. No fortified place. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Don't allow any room for the enemy to set up camp in your life. It means, uh, in the Greek, a place within a passage or a book. In other words, it spoke to me this way. Do not allow room in, your, in the story of your life that God is writing for the enemy to be written in, having his way at any point. And it means do not give him opportunity or even empower him to come in and meddle and bring destruction. In other words, we need to check these things. Lying, we need to check our anger, we need to cast out bitterness, verse 31, wrath, anger, clamor, all that evil speaking, all of that stuff, because unless we do that, we are going to give room, place, opportunity, and power to the enemy to bring destruction, and that's what he's seeking to do. And so now, as the new creation, the new man, the new woman in the Christian church, members one of, or of another are now responsible, if you will, we're responsible to now in a mature way begin to check these things in our lives so that they don't come in and destroy in our own individual life and within the midst of our congregation or within the body of Christ. Because see, one thing is we don't sin to ourselves. You falling into sin, your life being destructed affects the people in this room. And there's no way to avoid that. Notice he says, nor give place to the devil. Now, we, we see this word, the devil, we know generally what it means. In the Greek, if you take a note, Strong 1228, 
diabolos, D-I-A-B-O-L-O-S. It means prone to slander, slanderous or accusing falsely. See, the Bible calls Satan the accuser of the brother. See, here's the thing that Satan does. He wants opportunity to do two things. Listen very carefully. He wants opportunity to accuse God before you. And then he wants opportunity to accuse you before God. See, here's what he does. When you, when you get caught up in stuff and, and sin is entering in and these things begin to take effect in your life, the first thing Satan wants to do is come to you and accuse God. Oh, well, he's done with you. I can't, you look at you. you. You're a mess. He's, he's done with you this time. How many times does he bore with you in this mess? He's not. No, he's done this time. You know, you've really screwed up this time. What, it, what he wants to do is accuse God of not being the loving, merciful, long-suffering God who says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And if you confess your sins to me, I am faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And this is the God that we know and we serve. But Satan has opportunity to lie to you when sin creeps in. And because sin is deceitful, it's got you in a vulnerable place. And he sets up camp and condemns you. And hinders your repentance and your restoration. And while he's beating you over the head, he's up in the throne room saying, God, you see that rascal? Look, he done done it again. I don't know why you, you bear with that rascal. And he goes up there and he begins to lie on you to God. But think, Lord, John says that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the faithful, who says, Satan, get thee behind me because he's been covered and washed in my blood and you're a liar and the father of it. Let's not give him room to work in our lives. And don't think your life can be, can be isolated from the body and not matter. No, it matters. So, first point on our outline is that the new man is learning to limit the enemy's effectiveness. These are the ways we do that. Second point. The new man is learning to be a more productive member of the body of Christ. Verse 28 through 29. Look at it with me. It says in verse 28, let him who stole steal no longer. That's good news. That's good verses because we all left our cars in the parking lot. <laughs> and we don't, want, we don't want no more stealing going on. No, no. He says, let him who steal. Now, you got to think about the context of the new, uh, the new Testament first century church. It was filled with millions of slaves who were not cared for, taken care of, and their mentality was nobody's looking out for me, so I'm gonna have to look out for myself. So thieving or being a thief was rampant, but notice contextually he's talking to the church in Ephesus, which means that this was going on in the church. In other words, they're bringing the old world mentality into the church. And many of you may say, well, Pastor Kevin, I'm not a thief, nor do I struggle with covetousness and stealing, so there's really no application here for me, but there is application for you. There is application because the thought process is in the world that, listen, socially, politically, the government's jacked up. I mean, look, ain't nobody looking out for me. I might as well look out for myself and make sure I'm taking care of numero uno, right? That's the mentality of the world. Whereas the new man is learning something different. In fact, what we're learning in Philippians 2 on the screen, 3 through 4, where Paul says to the Philippian church, let nothing be, be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each one esteem others actually better than themselves. Romans 12 says, giving preference to one another. He says in verse 4, let each one of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. And so that mentality we have in the world has to get checked at the door because now as part of the church, we are members one of another. And we're all blessed as each one of us are blessed. And therefore, our mentality must be, let me sacrifice myself for the good of the body of which I am a member, you see. And so our lives must change. And in fact... He gives instruction. Look at it with him again. Let him who stole still no longer, but rather in contrast, let him labor working with his hands what is good. Did you notice that? In other words, let him not be a burden on the body of Christ, but let him labor with his hands what is good. 
Now, this is interesting. Stay with me for a moment. It is good to work. We were created for work. In fact, the first thing Adam received once God blew life into his nostrils and they, 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 they met and conversed, and the first thing God gave Adam was a job. He walked him into the garden and says, look at what I've created for you, and it was amazing. But I need you to tend it and keep it and name all the animals. And so Adam went to work, and he began to do the things that God had put before him, and, and work is healthy. In fact, it's what we're supposed to do. We're not to be a burden, but we're be, to be hard workers. In fact, I got a call for somebody that was looking for financial assistance not too long ago. The person didn't go to our church. And I said, well, what church do you go to? The person said, well, I don't, I don't believe in, in uh, the organized church. I said, man, we, we got an issue. Because I don't believe in giving the organized church's money to somebody that doesn't believe in going to the organized church. <laughs> I said that basically. And, and I want y'all to know, in fact, how I've instructed leaders here, the, the pastors, elders, and deacons. And I just want you to know this. This is what they're instructed to do. Anytime somebody shows up asking for financial assistance, their first rule is not to bring them to me, especially on a Sunday or Wednesday. I'm here to minister to you all. Number two they tell the person, you must first attend church. And if they say, well, I already go to a church that didn't go to that church and ask for assistance, okay? Number three, after you attend church, then you can meet with two, a pastor, elder, two pastors, two elders, whatever, two leaders who will use discernment from the Lord as to how to minister to your situation. Because now at 11 years old, we've been lied to up and down. I had one guy got mad with me, even followed me, tried to follow me home anyway. Um, but got mad with me because I wouldn't give him money. When investigating his budget, I found out that he had uh, cable TV, internet, and get this, doggy insurance. <laughs> and, and the church is supposed to feed you? No, cut off the dog. Get rid of the doggy insurance. The dog will be all right. <laughs> cut the cable. I mean, no, we're not, not here for that. No, we're not doing that, sir. Let's look at the budget. You know, because the thing is, listen. Our life should add something to the body of Christ. Notice what I mean. Stay with me too, y'all, okay? Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather, and that reminds me, I need some of the retired men to volunteer to do uh, security when the women's ministry gathers because they've had knuckleheads come asking why they're here, you know, and I want to make sure we got security. And it happened on the day I was out of town. <laughs> we'll edit that out. Um, <laughs> Let him who stole still no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good. Now, you would think, listen, you would think he's saying, do this so that you can take care of yourself. You would think he's saying that so you can take care of your own needs and not be a burden. You would think that's the reasoning behind him saying that. And that is a byproduct of it. But everyone look at the verse. He says, let him who stole still no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good that he may have something to give to him who has need. Bear with me for a moment. So that he can have something to give when there's someone in need. Because we are actually members one of another. You know, Luis read a verse earlier that, you know, he who has this world's goods shouldn't shut up his hand to his brother, right? right. Okay. He didn't know really what I was teaching. He just was led of the spirit in that. And that's a good verse. Because I think what's happening is what we need to understand is as a member of the body of Christ, I want to be a participant in the body of Christ in every way that I can. And I think in order to do that, I have a responsibility because I'm members of you and you're members of me. I actually have a responsibility to manage my own personal finances in such a way that I'm able to contribute to the work of God within the body of Christ. So it is irresponsible for me not to manage them and not to include God in it as an act of worship so that I can have the benefit and the joy of being a part of everything that God is doing. So if I haven't managed to the point where I can give to the church and give when people are in need, that is irresponsible on my part because I'm members of you and you are members of me. That is what he says. Look at it with me. He says that he may have something to give him who has need. Paul says that you be diligent so that on the first day of the week when you gather, you can lay something aside as God has prospered you to take care of the poor brothers back in Jerusalem. Why? Because we are members of one another, and this is part of our role within the body of Christ. 
And see, when we exclude God from that area of our lives and we are not fully worshiping him, we have an idol, and that idol is called mammon because it's so important, or money in, in English, it's so important to us that we refrain from let God be a part of our financial lives. He should be number one on our budget. Why? Because we are the people of God. And Jesus said, is it more blessed to give than to receive? In other words, I benefit spiritually from giving because I'm filled with joy that comes from God that I, I can't, you know, explain. And that's the truth. I've told you that before. I love going on the little secure gift thing and they got the categories. I love that, you know, being able to, to contribute to those things. And I, I want to be able to do that. And I feel like it is our responsibilities as members of the body of Christ. So in this section, we are learning as new believers, as, as a new creation to be more productive members of the body of which we have been birthed into. And we are not isolated from or separate from. The Bible says a man who isolates himself seeks his own wills, Proverbs 18.1. But we are called not to forsake this assembling together the saints to be with one another, exhorting each other more and more as we see the day approach because we are part of an eternal family. And I can't get rid of you if I want to because if I get rid of you down here, you're going to be right my face when I die and go to heaven <laughs> there you go you know like and we're going to be together for all eternity so we need to be productive members of the body not just you know existing in fact I think that probably introducing a Dave Ramsey or crown ministry type of ministry at some point would be healthy for this reason just because we come across this verse because it's a good thing amen all right and get a lot of amens there we're going to go on <laughs> Last section, we're almost over time. The last part of this is that we also become effective members. I got a lot, a lot of work to do here. Um, through an effective use of our speech. Look at verse 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Beautiful verse. We're over time, so let me kind of work through this one a little bit. Um, no corrupt speech. The first thing we think about is that we shouldn't be cursing, you know, <laughs> right? And, you know, it is sad when Christians curse. I can't stand it. It just, it, it comes off to my, my ears don't like it anymore. You know, I just don't, don't like it. But the, 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 the interesting thing is it's not just that. He actually, this word corrupt, um, corrupt communication, actually, corrupt word here in the New King James, in the, in the King James, corrupt communication, it literally means this, something that is rotten or putrefied. It means, it means, listen, rotting meat that stent has a stench to it you follow me something that literally stinks you ever drove down the road and you come across a rotting carcass and you had your window down and your mouth open <laughs> y'all know what i'm talking about oh my goodness oh oh you can't stand it that's how god feels when corrupt speech comes out of our mouth this word word here communication in king james but here no corrupt word here in the New King James, that means a kind or style of speaking. So let no rotten style of speaking come out of your mouth. It implies not just cursing, it implies this, contentious speaking. Um, it also, check this out, implies doctrine that is off base from biblical truth. We're a growing church, diverse, coming from different backgrounds. And so God is working all of that out through the teaching of the word that we get rid of doctrines that don't line up to the word because that is corrupt speech and we won't, don't want to have that in our midst. Amen? We, yeah, with little leaven, leaven's a whole lump. Or anything reported in speech, any, any uh, matter under discussion. In other words, how we talk is extremely important. Jesus said, and I didn't bring this reference verse, but he said over in Matthew that every idle word that we speak, we will give an account for it in the kingdom when it comes. When we stand before the Lord, every idle word, we must give an account for it. So I believe that in order to be a productive member of the body, not only should we add something with our lives, but we also should be very careful what comes out of our mouth. Now I've got a responsibility to think before I speak. In fact, the longer I'm saved, the quieter I become. Because <laughs> I'm realizing... I wish I could go back and take that away. I can't. Oh, Lord, man, we can edit the, the tapes, but I, I just need to be more careful what comes out of my mouth because if it's not edifying, if it's not, listen, notice he says, here's why. But what is good, notice, for necessary edification. In other words, what comes forth from my mouth and what comes from your mouth 
needs to be things that are good for what is called necessary edification. Now remember edification, the second time we've seen it in this chapter. Remember back up that he gave some of the apostles, prophets, evangelists, te- and pastors, teachers for the equipment of the saints for the work of the ministry. And that is for the edifying of the body of Christ. The word edifice means a structure that's being erected or built up. In other words, Jesus is building this building called the church. And what we say within the church should be words that flow in the direction of helping that building process and not hindering it. In other words, everything you say in the body of Christ is important. And we need to guard our tongue because of that. The Bible says that the, 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 that the tongue is the little member, but it's a fire set on blaze of hell. And little, we can speak words and they can bring so much destruction. We have to be careful. Our words need to impart grace notice to the hearers. You need to say things that are helpful. I, I found this little acronym on, on the screen, this image. It says, uh, before you speak, think. And the T stands for, is it true? The H for, is it helpful? The I, is it inspiring? The N, is it necessary? Because, you know, sometimes some people have just diarrhea of the mouth. And they open it and all kind of stuff just come out. Um, and, in, and then finally, is it kind? As a believer, we're connected to one another. I need to be careful what I say. Because one thing I can't stand is if I slip and say something that hurts somebody's feelings. And then I can't sleep. Until I can go get it right. So it's better for me to be careful what comes out to begin with. So I can love the person in my midst. Because that's what God really wants. Amen. Now we're, we're almost out of time. But bear with me. The last point for today is. The, the new man is learning to yield more and more to the Holy Spirit. Notice in verse 30 through 32. He says. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. By whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You could say, do not offend the Holy Spirit, which would then hinder his work in our lives. Listen, these sins, lying, anger, or wrath, and stealing, and what we're going to see in verse 31, bitterness, wrath, all of that, clamor, evil speaking, um, all that kind of stuff. These sins, which are against our brothers and sisters, are also an offense against the divine spirit which inhabits the body of believers, meaning the collective body, as well as your individual body. And it means that we have an obligation laid upon us to live in deep respect or reverence for the Holy Spirit who dwells within us as God literally dwelling in us and with us. We need to be sensitive to the spirit. We need to be careful to, to, to try to sense and, and seek his leading in every situation. Our speech should be seasoned with salt. In other words, let the Holy Spirit direct what we say. When we get angry, let the Holy Spirit direct the next move we make. We need to yield to the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit yearns jealously for us, which means he's trying to constantly draw us close to God. But this old dead flesh is constantly trying to do what it wants to do. And so as, ye, as we yield, he says to us in verse 31, let all of these things, bitterness, wrath, anger, bitterness comes when we don't deal with the things that happen among us. Anger and wrath and anger, clamor, evil speaking, be put away from us, cast away with all malice. Get rid of these things. Because when we learn to do that and we learn to yield to the Holy Spirit, we begin to find out as he says, and be kind to one another and tender hearted. We begin to learn that this is the heart of our God and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, the way that we really do these things is in the, the end of this chapter, forgiving one another even as God has, uh, had Christ, God in Christ has forgiven us. And what happens with this, I believe more than anything else, is when I recognize how God has dealt with me, through his son, that kind of breaks me and directs how I then deal and talk with and interact with people around me because I realize I am a wretched sinner who did not deserve his grace or his love, yet he demonstrated his love towards me when I was a sinner and didn't care about him, you know. I didn't deserve his love and his grace, but yet he sent his son to die on the cross. I don't deserve his constant presence in my life, his spirit, yet he filled me with his Holy Spirit and sealed me with it. You know, I don't deserve any of that. I'm wretched. I know myself. 
yet the way he deals with me teaches me how I should be with you and how you should be with me and how we should be with one another. With this kindness and this tenderheartedness and a heart to forgive. And as we learn to yield to the Holy Spirit, this is how we end up treating one another. Because the truth is, we're all wretched sinners outside of the, the leading of the Spirit in our lives. And so that should direct how we treat one another always. And that's all we have time for as we weigh over. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you today for your word. And we thank you for allowing us to be here. Lord, I pray that you would go before us now, that you would provide safe passage for all who are here, that you would be with us in our cars and on the highways, Lord, in our homes, in our workplace, the cubicle, the shop, the lab, the hospital room, Lord, the, uh, the classrooms even, the marketplaces, and even when we're alone, that you would be with us, give us discernment, lead us by your spirit, Lord God, into righteousness, into truth, into a closer walk with you, because, Lord, we need you more than anything that this world has to offer. I pray that for every person in this room, as we part from this place, in the name of Jesus, let's say together, saints, amen. Let's stand and sing.